Okay, so we're going to start our lecture on loss, grief, and dying. And this is chapter 17 in your book. Starts on page 356. So what is loss? Um, loss does not just refer to death. So it is an undesired change or removal of a valued object, person, or situation. Okay. Some loss is expected at each de uh, de developmental stage. Okay. For example, infants have to give up the breast or the bottle. And those of you that have kids know how difficult this loss can be. So it can be something like that as we move through our developmental stages. So when we're categorizing loss, so there's actual loss. Actual loss includes the death of a loved one or a relationship or some type of theft or deterioration or destruction or natural disaster, right? This loss can be identified by others, not just the person experiencing it. So for example, hair loss during chemotherapy, that would be an actual loss. Then there's a perceived loss. So this is internal. It is identified only by the person experiencing it. So for example, a woman with a sexually transmitted infection may perceive loss of her purity, right? That would be perceived. Physical loss, this includes um, injuries. So maybe a loss of a limb or an amputation. It includes organ removal. So maybe a hysterectomy or loss of function. So maybe your patient's paralyzed. Those are all going to be physical losses. Then there's psychological losses. So these are commonly seen in areas of sexuality or control or fairness or meaning and trust. Okay, so the loss of the youth or the loss of um, limbs or body disfigurement or body functions can all negatively impact somebody's perception of themselves. That would cause a psychological loss or a loss of hope, a loss of faith, a loss of dreams, that kind of thing. Then there's external losses. So these are losses of objects with sentimental or monetary value. So jewelry or a home or something like that. Then there's an environmental loss. So this involves a change in the familiar, even if the change is perceived as positive. So for example, moving to a new home, getting a new job, going to college, that kind of thing. Um, and then a loss of a significant relationship. So this is gonna be including, but not limited to the loss of a spouse or sibling or family member, significant others going through a death or divorce or a separation. So that's loss. Now, what is grief? So grief um, is a physical, psychological, and spiritual response to a loss. So significant losses cause grieving, okay? Grieving requires energy expenditure and can interfere with the health and delay healing in, in patients and in all people. So even though grief can cause the before mentioned, so um, all of that loss, it can cause all of that stuff. It is still a positive function and it is necessary psychologically after a loss that we have time to grieve. There is no single correct way to grieve and the process is fluid and ongoing. Um, mourning is um, actions associated with grief. So for example, wearing black, that would be associated um, mourning, right? And then bereavement. This is a period of mourning and an adjustment after loss. So theoretical foundations of grief. So several theorists have provided insight into the grief process. So you can look on table 17-1 on page 358 um, to review them all. However, I want you to know the Kubler-Ross, the five stages of grief written by Kubler-Ross, okay? So those five stages of grief, you can find more on page 363 about those. So it's important for you to know individuals may not experience every stage of grief or go through the stages in a linear order, okay? Individuals may also experience two or more stages at the same time. So remember, this is just the Kubler-Ross um, grief model here, okay? So we're going to talk about the five stages of grief per her. Um, so denial is stage one. So this is where a person is in shock and doesn't believe that this could be happening to them. 
Stage two is anger. So this can be very subtle or can be very obvious. It's kind of a why me type, type feel. Stage three is bargaining. So this is where uh, people will start bargaining with a higher power. I swear, if you just bring him back, I will never drink again. Stage four is depression. So this is where someone is withdrawn and sad. It's not clinical depression, but this is a normal response to a loss or an impending loss. And then stage five is finally acceptance. So this is coming to term with the death and no longer fighting it. And you can see all of these in this picture on your screen here. So what factors affect grief? Well, there's a variety of them. So the significance of the loss is going to affect the grief. So the meaning the person has attached to the person or object that has lost is going to be different for each person. The more attachment to the relationship or object, the more difficult the grieving is going to be. Um, a, a person's support system. So the amount of support that the person has um, as they go through their grief journey. People with more emotional and psychological support typically have less complicated grief. And we'll talk about complicated grief in a minute. Um, unresolved conflict. So if there's conflict existing at the time of death, um, that may cause prolonged grief. Circumstances of the loss. So if the circumstances of the loss leave the bereaved feeling guilty or responsible, his or her healing process may be affected by that. Previous loss, so if the person has sustained more than one loss in a short period of time, the grieving process is going to be much more complicated. And then spiritual and cultural relief uh, or belief and practices, these are going to affect that as well. So um, these can help or hinder the grieving processes. So most cultures engage in rituals like funerals, right? Um, and these help the bereaved begin the grieving process by openly expressing their emotions and pain. So some cultures may emphasize keeping those emotions more subdued and limiting their expressions of grief in private settings. And that can, again, hinder and or help the process. The timeliness of death. So the death of a child or a young person is almost always more difficult to accept than the death of an older person. In addition to the loss of that person, there is a sense of unfairness because of the loss of potential, what this child may have been or what they could have achieved. You may hear someone say, why was her life cut short? Or he had so much going for him. God didn't give him a chance, that kind of thing. And then the developmental stage of the bereaved person. So developmental stages are an important factor in grieving. So it can affect the healthy development of life stages. And in turn, the person's stage of development can affect the grieving process. A child is gonna grieve differently than as an adult, than as an elderly person. So there's multiple different types of grief. Okay, so there's uncomplicated grief. This is normal grief. This is the natural response to loss. So the bereaved person experiences the feelings, behaviors, and cognitions that are expected um, in light of their culture, social status, or relationship um, to the lost person, right? The emotions are intense, but gradually diminish over time. So several months to several years after. Some emotions will always be present, but the intensity of those emotions will change. For example, when your grandmother dies after a long history of Parkinson's disease, you were expecting it because she is older and the Parkinson's disease had affected her for so long. Then there's complicated grief. So complicated grief is distinguished from uncomplicated grief by length of time and intensity of emotion, okay? So in complicated grief, the person's responses are maladaptive or dysfunctional. They're usually prolonged or overwhelming. So complicated grief results when the grieving process has been impeded for some reason. For example, something keeps that person stuck in the grief process, okay? For example, multiple recent losses, that could keep someone stuck in the grieving process, right? There's three types of complicated grief. So there's chronic complicated grief. So this begins as normal grief, but it continues long-term with little resolutions of feelings and the inability to rejoin normal life. Then there's masked grief. So this occurs when the person is grieving, 
but expressing the grief through other types of behavior. So this can be a person who starts drinking heavily or a couple who argues a lot after the loss of their child, right? These clients are doing everything to try to cover or mask their grief. Then there's delayed grief. So um, delay, delayed grief is grief that is put off until a later time. For example, they may say, I think I'll think about it later. Right now I'm busy trying to keep a roof over our heads and care for my children, right? And then moving on, there's disenfranchised grief. So this is the experienced connection, the experience in connection with the loss that is not socially supported or acknowledged by the usual rites or ceremonies. Okay, so disenfranchised grief may be experienced by a man whose wife had a miscarriage um, or a mistress whose lover dies or a bereaved partner in a homosexual relationship. This is something that society um, doesn't accept for some reason. It's not socially supported. So it's hard, hard grief, which is called disenfranchised grief, right? It's not right, but it, it exists, right? The grief is recognized by the families or the, the patient's normal social support. However, in each of these instances, the bereaved person lacks the community support that is helpful in grieving. Then there's anticipatory grief. So this is the experience, um, this is experienced before the loss even occurs. So the potential negative outcome of anticipatory grief is that the survivor may detach from a dying person too early in the dying process, which leaves that person without emotional support during that period, okay? For example, maybe um, anticipatory grief, an example would be a husband of a breast cancer victim, Maybe the wife has been sick and had a terminal diagnosis for almost a year, and the husband is no longer visiting, has started new hobbies, and spends less and less time with the wife, right, because they've let go too soon. So as a question, so as a nurse, how can we anticipate a client who might experience difficult grieving? So after reviewing the four types of grief, you would expect someone with a very sudden loss, right? Because they didn't have time to prepare for the death, right? So they might experience difficult grieving or someone who's had experience with multiple losses very close together. That may cause difficult grieving as well. So as a nurse, how can we tell the difference between grief and depression? So remember what depression looks like, what depression looks like on, um, in a, a patient in an actual depressive um, episode. So in that your client is unkempt, they have insomnia, they have visual hallucinations, they're not eating well. That would be normal. Um, that would be a clinical diagnosis of depression. Depression during the stages of grief is not that. It is an expected normal response to a loss. Okay, so if it turns into a clinical depression, if it goes from normal grieving to a clinical depression, we're going to see those signs of clinical depression, long standing, they're unkempt, they've lost all interest in daily activities, they can't get themselves out of bed, they're not eating well, they can't sleep, things like that. That's when it's then progressed into uncomplicated grief, right? So a young woman's fiance died in a car accident one month prior to their wedding day. Since his death, she has become sexually promiscuous. What type of grief, if any, is this woman displaying? The answer is C, masked grief. The woman is expressing her grief through maladaptive behavior to mask her grief, right? Being promiscuous is not helping, but it's making her feel better at the time. It's masked grief. So when we talk about death, we need to know how is death defined? So the brainstem can still be functioning in higher brain death. So the brainstem can still be functioning. So both respiratory and cardiac activity may continue, even though the person does not make purposeful responses to external stimuli. Okay. So um, those cephalic reflexes are absent. So they have no gag reflex. They have no pupillary reflex. Um, and then 
they're going to get an, uh, an EEG that's going to show no brain activity, right? So the Uniform Law Commission redefined death broadly as the irreversible cessation of all functioning of the brain, including the brainstem. Okay, so brainstem death has to be present for um, a patient to be defined as dead, right? So the Uniform Determination of Death Act. So this is pretty important because it's the most recent law that governs how we declare death. Okay, so it was adopted in 1981 to further clarify and expand on the previous definition. Okay, so providers use several methods to assess for functioning of the brainstem. Okay, we know that brainstem death has to be present for death, right? So how are we going to check for that? So the pupils are gonna be fixed. They're gonna be unresponsive to light. They're not gonna have a corneal reflex. They're gonna have no vestibulo-ocular reflexes and brain stem function must be lost to declare death, okay? Um, Doctors may also obtain something called a cerebral blood flow study. So this is where contrast dye is given through the IV and the CT scanner looks at blood flow through the brain. Um, you can see this um, example here on this slide. As to the left, you see a healthy brain. In the middle, you see brain dead. And then off to the end, you see a vegetative state. That is an example of cerebral blood flow study. So then there's also um, comas and persistent vegetative states as well, where maybe their brainstem function is not absent, right? So maybe they're not dead. So a coma is a prolonged deep state of unconsciousness lasting days or even years, right? The patient cannot be aroused and may or may not have decreased brainstem reflexes. That is a coma. A persistent vegetative state can result from higher cerebral functioning. So this person does not purposefully respond to stimuli. They're unaware of the environment and they have no cognition or mental functions. They may grimace, they may cry or laugh, but these actions are not in relation to the world around them. This makes it really difficult for their families because they believe that they're getting better. Neither of these patients can obey commands or can purposely respond to stimuli in their environment. All right, so the physiological stages of dying. So unfortunately, death and dying are a part of our sometimes daily life, depending in, on the specialty that you enter into in nursing. So these are, um, this is a timeline of what we're kind of looking for and assessing for as a patient is, is moving through the dying process. So one to three months prior to death, your patient's going to begin to withdraw from the world and from people. They're going to they're gonna sleep more. It's going to become difficult for their body to digest food, especially meat, and their appetite and food intake are going to decrease. They're going to prefer to only drink liquids. And then anorexia, which they may experience, which is not eating, right? This may be protective because the resulting ketosis that they may get from eating can diminish or the, that they may get from not eating may diminish pain and increase the person's sense of well being. So, then one to two weeks prior to death, a host of physical changes um, indicate the body is beginning to lose its ability to maintain itself. So, cardiovascular changes are going to cause a decrease in blood pressure. They're going to have an irregular and weakened pulse. They may have liver failure that may result in jaundice, right? Or that yellowing of the skin or the eyes. Um, respiratory changes may result in periods of brief apnea during sleep. And they may have a non-productive cough. That's one to two weeks prior to death. So then we move to days and hours prior to death. So often in this particular part, days and hours prior to, to dying, they have a surge of energy. And that brings mental clarity and a desire to eat and talk with family members. This is a problem because this happens and this can cause family to think that they aren't going to die. 
However, good education on your part and explanations to them are really important during this period so that you allow them to know that this is a normal part and that often this is the most energy they're going to have during the dying process and it will still progress to a dying um, moment, right? As death approaches, patients tend to become dehydrated and they have difficulty swallowing, which results in decreased blood volume, right? Um, always remember that as nurses, we can still do small interventions during this stage. That's going to mean the world to our clients and their families. So for instance, during this stage, the days and hours prior to death, we can wet their lips with a moist cloth or we can apply chapstick. It's very helpful and it's very easy to do and it makes a big difference in their comfort. It would also be a good intervention to delegate to the family if they're that type of family so that they can stay busy. They can feel like they're contributing, right? So more changes here in um, days and hours prior to death. You may notice respiratory changes like irregular breathing with lengthening periods of apnea. Okay, so that, that surge of energy has now gone away. They're getting more lethargic. They're having irregular breathing. They may experience those Shane Stokes respirations that we talked about, right? They may get what we call a death rattle. So a death rattle, this is a term used to describe the congestion in the patient's chest that can be pretty loud. It's very unsettling for the family. So a patient-friendly intervention that works well is to turn the client on their side and raise the head of the bed, okay? Remember that as we do that, we turn them to the side. So any drainage that they may have in their mouth can kind of run out of their mouth versus right down their throat, right? And then raising the head of the bed can also prevent aspiration and things like that, right? Remember at the end of the, at, during this dying process, we're trying to meet the physiological needs of the body at the end of life without being overly invasive, okay? So then circulatory changes that you may see, hypotension. They may have a clammy feeling with cool and mottled extremities. So mottled extremities, meaning they kind of get that um, purplish blue lacy pattern to their legs. It usually starts from the feet and works its way up the body. Okay. Um, you also may notice renal failure. So they may have decreased urinary output. Their peristalsis is gonna, show, gonna slow and they may be incontinent of bowel and bladder even if they weren't before. And then their cognition. In the final hours of life, many patients um, become restless or agitated, um, disoriented, right? This response may be caused by medications. It can be caused by liver failure, renal failure, the, the buildup of toxins in the blood. All of that can cause them to be confused. Um, and then when we move on to moments prior to death, what are we going to see? So the dying person does not respond to touch or sound and they cannot be awakened. Typically there's a short series of long spaced breaths before breathing ceases entirely and the heart stops beating, right? These can be, um, these can be Shane Stokes respirations as well, right? There may be congestion called the death rattle that can be kind of loud and the patient may feel clammy. And then at the time of death, their sphincters relax, okay? And when the patient dies, bowel and bladder incontinence occurs. They always go to the bathroom when they die because their sphincters relax, okay? So some things to remember about the dying process is that some family members, family members are kind of your patients as well during this process. They need help and they need comfort from you. They don't need false hope. They don't need timelines, okay? You cannot predict the time of death. I always tell my patients, I'd be a millionaire if I could, if I could predict this for you. Um, so just remember, death is unpredictable, okay? So, so how do healthcare providers tell if a patient has died? So we tell at the bedside, right? Remember, it has to be an absence of brainstem activity, right? So, but we're at the bedside. We're not doing any kinds of crazy brain, brain scans or anything like that. We tell a patient has died because 
we listen to their heart sounds and we hear none. So there's an absence of heart sounds, which is also called asystole, okay? So asystole is present when the patient has died. And then the respiratory system, there is no respirations. Respirations have ceased, okay? That's how we tell at the bedside. And then we want to talk about end-of-life care. So in a lot of specialties, particularly hospice or long-term care, there comes a time where we can identify that the patient is probably dying within the next few months, and they get placed on end-of-life care, okay? So with that, the patient has some kind of terminal diagnosis, most likely, the patient is going to acknowledge the seriousness of the situation, and the goal is to ensure compassion, sensitivity, and competence, okay? Same thing with, with palliative care, okay? Palliative care is... Palliative care is about keeping the patient comfortable, Okay, so you let's look at the difference here in this table here. So the difference between hospice care and palliative care. So hospice care, this is aggressive pain, symptom, and quality of life management. Palliative care is also aggressive pain, symptom, and quality of life management. Okay, so that means we're going to, instead of treating their problem, there may, we may not be treating their cancer anymore. They might not be getting chemo anymore. We're going to treat their pain aggressively. If they have pain, we're going to do what we can to make them comfortable. Okay. Um, with hospice care, the patient has a terminal or untreatable illness with fewer than six months to live on the normal course of the disease. And then with palliative care, the patient has a serious chronic or life-limiting illness. Okay. With hospice care, care philosophy centers on a team approach that includes the patient and family. And it's the same with palliative care. And then with hospice care, the patient is not seeking curative measures or return to the hospital. And with palliative care, they may be seeking curative treatments and return to the hospital. Okay, so with that, um, the goal for both is to keep them comfortable. Okay, we want to support the families. We want to support the caregivers. We want to ensure continuity of care. We want to ensure that we give respect. We want to ensure that there is informed decision making. We want to manage their symptoms, right? Any pain, shortness of breath, depression. We want to manage all of that. Okay. Um, hospice care. A couple notes about that. So, um, Hospice providers consider helping family members an essential part of their role, okay? Typically with hospice care, care is available 24 hours a day and families are taught what to expect as the disease progresses. Hospice is more one-on-one. -on -one. They remain at the bedside as long as necessary. And there's typically follow-up with the family during the bereavement period after the patient passes. So the priority goal for hospice care is symptom management and keeping the patient comfortable. That's important for you to know. The priority goal for hospice care is symptom management and keeping the patient comfortable. So again, medicating for pain during the dying process. Okay, for example, a patient-centered goal for a patient on hospice would be patient demonstrates satisfactory pain control, right? So some legal and ethical situations or considerations, okay? So we need to know what these, what these things mean. So an advanced directive. So this is a group of instructions that are either written or oral, and they state a person's wishes regarding their health care if he or she were incapacitated or unable to make that decision, okay? An advanced directive states a person's wishes for their health care just in case there's a time when they cannot make that decision on their own. An ordinary power of attorney does not give another person the right to make healthcare decisions for the patient. Only a durable power of attorney and healthcare decisions can do that. Okay, that's just a side note. Okay, but just know that an advanced directive highlights the wishes in healthcare 
or if there is a time that the patient is incapacitated and cannot make it for themselves. It may say, I don't want a feeding tube, in which case, even if the patient was completely comatose, we wouldn't give them a feeding tube because they have an advanced directive in place. Okay. Um, a DNR or do not resuscitate. This is an order to not attempt resuscitation of a patient in the event of cardiac failure. So a patient codes, right? The heart stops, the breathing stops. And if they have a DNR in place, we do not attempt CPR. Um, assisted suicide. So this means making available things that are needed for the patient to end their own life. Okay, so this could be medication, it could be weapons, anything like that. So the patient is physically capable of ending their own life and has expressed the intention to do so and has turned to the healthcare provider to supply the means. Okay. The American Nurses Association prohibits nurses' participation in assisted suicide and euthanasia because these acts are in direct violation of the nurses' ethical traditions and goals of the profession. Okay, nurses have an obligation to provide humane, comprehensive, and compassionate care that respects the rights of patients, but upholds the standards of the profession in the presence of chronic debilitating illness at the end of life. So we cannot do that, right? Euthanasia refers to the deliberate ending of a life of someone suffering from a terminal or incurable illness. So active euthanasia occurs as a result of direct action. So giving an overdose of medication, right? And then passive euthanasia occurs as a result of lack of action. So withholding medications or food necessary to sustain life, okay? I've never worked in a place where this has been done, um, but I know that a few years back, there was some, um, some controversy with this happening in Washington state, I wanna say. I don't know a ton about it, but um, that would be something interesting to, um, to learn about a little bit. Um, autopsy. So this is a medical examination of the body to determine the cause of death that involves the removal of organs and the extractions of tissue samples. Autopsies have also provided relevant data about disease processes and causes, and it requires a signed permission from the next of kin except in cases in which autopsy is required by law, so deaths that are suspicious or unwitnessed, okay? And then a living will. So a living will is a document that gives specific instructions about what the patient wants or doesn't want, okay? Um, so what do you do as the nurse if the client asks you if he can change any of those above documents? What if he wants to change his advance directive or wants to change his living will? A client can change his mind about his treatment at any time. These documents are all about what the patient wants. So if he wants to change it, then we support him, okay? And so when we receive these documents, um, it's just our responsibility as the nurse to take that living will or to take that advanced directive, document in our charting system that it is present within the chart and then place it in the chart, okay? And that's our job as the nurse. So moving into the assessment for the terminally ill client and family. So in addition to the items listed on this slide, the following three assessments can be done for the dying client. Okay, so let's talk about these. So when the client and family are ready, we're gonna encourage them to talk about the client's wishes for burial or cremation or tasks that the client would like to have taken care of, such as giving away valuables or calling family members, right? Um, we want to determine whether the dying client has a living will or any advanced directives. And we want to discuss with the client family the possibility of organ donation, if it's appropriate, okay? So we also always want to assess knowledge base, okay? And this is of the patient and of the family. So we're assessing knowledge base as far as do they know what to expect? Are they, are they accepting this as reality? Are they in denial, right? We want to know their history of loss. We want to know what coping abilities and support systems they have, the meaning of the loss, depression and grief. So um, we know that grief tends to come and go, right? Um, and that depression may have several symptoms like sadness, insomnia, poor appetite, things like that, okay? We want to do a physical assessment on our client, 
right? What are they telling us? Are they telling us they're going to pass away soon? Are they telling us that it got a couple of months or so as an estimate, right? And then do a cultural and spiritual assessment. That's important during the dying process because those wishes are often, um, those, are, those wishes are often um, overlooked. And then this is just a few reminders regarding therapeutic communication, because this really comes in handy when speaking about the dying process, because it can be very difficult to talk about. There's lots of high emotions happening in these moments. So we want to perfect our listening skills. We want to provide active listening, looking, our pa looking the family and our patient in the eye, showing an open posture, risk being receptive to what they say. We want to encourage and accept their expression of feelings. We want to reassure them that it's not wrong to feel anger or relief or any of those other unacceptable feelings, right? We want to respond to any nonverbal cues with touch and eye contact. Let them know that we're there. We want to increase your self-awareness, continue to communicate, even in the case of a coma, okay? Um, you'll learn in a couple of slides that the hearing sense is the last to go. Okay, so even patients who may be in a coma, they may still be able to hear you. And the last thing that we want is for them to feel alone in their last moments. So facilitating grief, we want to um, encourage them to express their feelings. So we wanna encourage questions and we wanna to respond to them within a reasonable time. Maybe sit beside the head of the bed. Don't appear like you're rushed when you're in the room. When you observe the patient or the family member expressing their feelings, we want to encourage them to continue. Expect and accept a wide range of feelings, including anger, fear, and loneliness. Ask questions like, would you like me to help? What do you need? Be sure that everyone on the healthcare team understands and follows that plan of care. Okay, and don't compare another person's loss to your own experience. For example, avoid con comments such as, I know how you feel. Instead say, tell me how you feel. Recalling memories can be one of those ways as well. So one way to encourage recall is to go through photo albums with them, ask them questions about the people in the pictures, look for objects, objects of sentiment, like a family heirloom or something. Um, ask them about, ask them to share the relevance of that, share the significance of that. And then finding meaning. So facilitating life review is one technique to help the patient or family Recognize the unique contributions that this person that's passing away has made to family, friends, and society. Okay. Nursing diagnoses that are relevant to the dying process are going to include the following, grieving, complicated grieving, and then many others. So decisional conflict, powerlessness, denial, and hopelessness. Helping the family is of the dying client. So um, you can see more information on this on table 17-2 on page 370. Um, we're gonna have the family help with care if they're comfortable doing that. We want to encourage them to ask questions so that we can all be on the same page. We wanna provide follow-up referrals as needed. Encourage them to visit, or encourage them to visit the chapel or talk with the clergy if that's appropriate with their religion. We wanna provide guidance to them that we know that they may need these resources after this patient passes and acknowledge the feelings of a family, right? In my experience, one of the most important things you can do when including interventions is to encourage the family members to participate in the care for the patient whenever possible. Sometimes they really enjoy making sure that the patient looks presentable or they're wearing their favorite jewelry as they go. Um, other interventions, so explore the patient, the patient family's coping mechanisms, um, remind them to take care of themselves, teach them what to expect, provide reassurance, ask directly if they want to be present at the time of death so that you know if you should call them or how you can stay in touch with them. Never, ever, 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 ever give estimates on when the death will occur. If someone asks you, I need to go home and take a shower, do you think that she will pass while I'm gone? Your answer should always be something similar to, I cannot give you that information. Um, you should do whatever makes you feel most comfortable, 
Okay. Um, so at the moment of death, do not intrude. Give patients and patient family alone time to get through it. Let's test your knowledge. So the client is dying of cancer and can no longer swallow. The son states to the nurse, you must give dad some water. He has always drank a lot of water. This nurse's best response is, you sound very upset. Tell me more about your dad. Or B, your father is dying from cancer and water will not stop this process. C, research shows that withholding oral fluids decreases edema. Or D, I will call the provider and get a prescription to insert a nasogastric tube for the water. The correct answer is A, you sound very upset. Tell me more about your dad, okay? That is the mode that encourages the son to express his feelings about his father's death. Um, and every other option is not sentimental and we never want to talk to patients using medical jargon. So answer C, talking about oral fluids decreasing edema. First of all, that's not true. And second of all, we don't want to even call it edema necessarily. We don't want to use medical jargon. Okay. So expressing, uh, encouraging them to express their feelings as an answer A is the best option. And then providing postmortem care. So postmortem care includes the care of the patient's body after death and fulfilling any legal obligations, such as arranging transport to the morgue or the funeral home and determining the disposition of the patient's belongings. So it's important to provide support, but do not intrude on the family. Okay, so provide support as needed. Sometimes it's hard to verbalize your support during this time because you are grieving also. So telling the family that you're sorry for their loss and they can have as much time as the, at the bedside as they need is necessary and it's very comforting to the family. We never want to rush them. We want to encourage them to become a part of the postmortem care, okay? If they wish, if they want to help us give the patient a bed bath, if we, they want to help us comb their hair, we want to encourage them to be a part of that. We want to notify the primary care provider at the time of death. And after the patient passes, we provide a head-to-toe hygiene and incontinence care on the patient. We give them a full bed bath, head-to-toe, make sure they're in a clean gown, a clean brief, we comb their hair, we straighten or provide clean bed linens. We place them in a supine, in a natural position. We also have to close their eyes and place their dentures in their mouth. Okay, this is important to do within two to four hours of the time of death because within two to four hours, rigor mortis develops. And that's when the patient's body gets stiff as there's no blood flow, okay? So that's an important intervention. Also be sure that dressings are clean and remove all tubes and drains from the patients unless an autopsy is to be done, in which case we leave all of that intact. Then we arrange for um, transport to the morgue when the family is ready and they're done. Sometimes they like to sit with their loved one for an extended time and that's okay. And we always just wanna make sure that we um, document the time of death, that the postmortem care was provided and the time that the body's transported to the funeral home, okay? Um, when they talk about on this slide about a coroner's case, that you will find out as you work the facility, but sometimes if they've had a fracture within the last year, it could be a coroner's case or something like that. So um, that's what that means, okay? And then helping families after death. We wanna provide grief education. The grieving person may be fatigued from not sleeping. They may be disoriented. They may be unable to concentrate. So we want to reassure the person that such responses are expected and that there's no single right way to grieve. And also assure them that although the grief process takes time, the symptoms do not last forever. Okay. We want to provide emotional support immediately after the death. And then to help children deal with loss, some families may need information about helping children deal with grief, especially when there's a death in the family, okay? We may need to explain to them that children look at grief and loss differently than do adults. And also, it's normal for the nurse to feel grief when a patient dies as well. You may also need to take care of yourself, and that is an important part of it.